Welcome uh, to those of you who have already joined us. I hope that many others will be joining us uh, soon. Uh, I, uh, before I introduce our distinguished guests this evening, I just have one or a couple actually of announcements to make. Uh, one uh, uh, concerning our next event, which will be on December 8th. And this will be a lecture by uh, Dr. Faiza Haikal, Emeritus Professor of Egyptology at AUC. And she will be lecturing on translating ancient Egyptian uh, language and culture. And, you know, given that Netflix has now put up this uh, film on the discoveries in Sa'ara, I hope that we will have a large following because you know, there's a tremendous lot of uh, interesting information and material uh, to, uh, to 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 sort of uh, get to know as uh, from as lay people from outside the field. Um, the other thing that I wanted to draw your attention to is that after Professor Bello's uh, lecture, we will break for 15 minutes in order to allow uh, participants uh, to uh, write their questions, because we uh, will take the questions in writing. Now, if the number of participants is smaller, we may make this break only 10 minutes. And uh, this will allow Professor Bello to uh, look at the questions, uh, make decisions on what is repetitive, and I will um, help her through that process and perhaps even uh, moderate it uh, by selecting the most relevant questions that might uh, come our way. Um, so uh, this evening's lecture is entitled Translating Medieval Islamic Philosophy into Portuguese. And I am really delighted to be hosting and celebrating uh, my colleague, Catarina uh, Bello, uh, who has graciously accepted this invitation. Uh, Professor Bello uh, joined AUC in 2006, and she is now Associate Professor of Philosophy in the uh, Philosophy Department at AUC. Uh, she is a specialist in medieval Islamic philosophy, in particular Avicenna's and Averroes physics and metaphysics, as well as Al-Farabi, um, her research interests also encompass medieval Islamic theology, uh, al and medieval Christian philosophy with a focus on the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. She has also conducted research on German idealism, in particular Hegel's philosophy. Uh, Professor Bello authored several books and articles on Islamic philosophy, and Hegel. Uh, among uh, her publications, I will mention her three books, uh, Chance and Determinism in Avicenna and Averroes, which was published in 2007, uh, Averroes and Hegel on Philosophy and Religion, that was published in 2013, and uh, Spirit in Philosophy, a Metaphysical Inquiry, that was published in 2019. Uh, uh, Professor Bello is also an acclaimed and established uh, translator. She has uh, translated uh, three uh, books. Um, uh, her translations include um, uh, Averroes, works by Averroes and by Aristotle. And uh, finally, of course, her celebrated uh, um, translation of Al-Farabi's Virtuous City uh, that has earned her the uh, very distinguished award uh, in translation in 2019, the uh, Sheikh Hamad Award for Translation, an award that recognizes excellence in translation and promotes cooperation among cultures uh, as well as a deeper knowledge of Arab and Islamic culture. 
uh, obviously, uh, Professor Bello uh, writes, thinks, translates from and into uh, Arabic, English, and Portuguese. And this is just an absolutely marvelous uh, opportunity for us because it takes us out of the conventional sort of circle of languages that the center has been dealing with for English, French, Arabic, and brings us into the realm of a, uh, a different history and a different culture, uh, Portuguese culture, which is very dear to my heart and uh, on many levels. And so I'm really very happy to be able to open up this new uh, space uh, within the center to understand uh, and learn about an area that so many of us um, know very little about. Um, and so I, I am thrilled that you are able to join us, uh, Professor Bello. And uh, without further ado, I uh, give you the floor and look forward to your lecture tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Samia Mehrez. Thank you very much for your invitation to uh, speak at this uh, distinguished uh, forum. And I'm grateful also to the. Uh, Center for Translation Studies at AUC. And, um, and so I'll begin, I'll uh, begin my, my talk. Um, and so I've, I've carried out some, uh, so I'll talk a little bit of, about my, um, first the connection between um, Arabic and Portuguese, the two languages, and uh, also the state of Arabic studies in Portugal and Brazil, because that um, has an impact on the translations that are being produced. And then finally, I'll focus on my translations from Arabic um, into Portuguese. And, uh, and this paper is based on, on, on my research. I've carried out research on uh, also the topic of um, um, uh, 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 translation from uh, Portuguese, uh, from Arabic into Portuguese. Um, and also it's based on, on, on my work on translation. And so regarding the connection between Arabic and Portuguese, there's an old connection. Uh, so <clears throat> the Portuguese language derives primarily from Latin, as you know, and it's a, a Romance language like Italian, and Spanish and French, but it, it has many loan words from other languages and many words in Portuguese come from Arabic. Uh, and especially words related to agriculture and also, uh, but also everyday words. And uh, you might wonder why do we have so much Arabic in, in Portuguese? And this is because um, Portugal was part of Al Andalus, uh, also known as uh, Islamic Spain, medieval Islamic Spain. And, um, and during the uh, early Middle Ages, the Iberian Peninsula, that's Portugal and Spain, was on one political unit. And then Portugal and Spain became two independent countries later in the Middle Ages. Um, and so it was in 1143 that Portugal became an independent country and separated from the other Iberian uh, kingdoms. But Southern Portugal, uh, the Algarve, which Algarve is an Arabic um, name, the name of this uh, province, and it's, uh, it comes from Al Gharb, which, because this was Gharb Al Andalus, the west of Al Andalus. Um, and so in the mid 12th century, there was still, um, uh, the, the southern part was still under Arab and Islamic rule. Um, and then in the uh, uh, mid 13th century, Portugal became uh, more or less uh, the way it is now. Um, and, uh, and so just a sort of very, very brief history of the Iberian Peninsula, there were these, um, obviously there was the uh, Islamic Arab conquest, um, and then um, the, there was a Christian reconquest, and after that there were several Christian king kingdoms, and in um, uh, Portugal remained independent since uh, the Middle Ages, whereas the other Christian kingdoms united to form Spain. So that's how Portugal is a uh, um, 
a se separate country within the Iberian Peninsula with its own language. And, uh, and so due, due to the Arab presence in Portugal for over 500 years, uh, many Portuguese words come from Arabic and Portugal has remained close to, to the Arab world, in particular, North Africa. And in fact, in a, um, a straight line, um, uh, Rabat, the Moroccan capital is closer to Lisbon than Madrid is. So um, and we still have buildings uh, from the age of Al-Andalus in Portugal, if you visit. And naturally the Arab presence is an important part of Portuguese history and culture. Um, and one contemporary translator from Arabic into Portuguese, Adalbert Clark, has published a published dictionary of uh, Portuguese words of uh, Arabic origin. He has found more than 20,000 of them, so many loan words. Um, and also the, this interaction between the two languages led to a linguistic phenomenon uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, and this phenomenon is uh, al, al jamiadu so it's uh, Portuguese written in Arabic characters. Um, and so the medieval period, the Middle Ages could be seen as the first phase of interaction between uh, the Portuguese and the Arabic languages. Uh, however, the, the ties between Portugal and the Arab world did not cease with the Christian conquest of the Algarve. Um, and they regained momentum, the link between Portugal and the Arab world will gain momentum with the inception of the uh, Portuguese voyages of discovery around the globe from the 15th century onwards. And, and so this is the second major phase of um, period of interaction between the two languages. And so the Portuguese built courts and castles along the, along the African and Asian coasts from Morocco to Oman, um, where Portuguese words in Arabic indicate a former Portuguese presence and in many um, Asian countries. Um, and these, the goal of these voyages was to expand the trading network for, uh, around the globe. And then uh, interpreters and uh, translators food in Arabic were in demand to accompany the Portuguese explorers on their um, maritime travels. In a well-known example of this collaboration is found in the person of an Arab pilot who guided Vasco da Gama around the eastern African coast and the Indian Ocean. And um, uh, this guide was, uh, has been identified by some scholars as Ahmed ibn uh, Majid, and he died around uh, 1500. And he's mentioned in uh, Portugal's national epic poem, The Lusiads, written by Luís Vaz de Um And an, an example of this, uh, how Arabic, um, influence Portuguese and then uh, in some of these words went on to be adopted in other languages. For instance, monsoon, you know, the uh, um, uh, the rains that, uh, seasonal rains in India, um, mon the term monsoon comes from the Portuguese monsoon and monsoon in turn comes from the Arabic mausim, um, which season, which means season in Arabic, so the rain season. Uh, and so I, now I'd like to talk about the, uh, the state of Arabic studies in, in Portugal. Um, and uh, in spite of this uh, long history of fruitful interaction between Portugal and the Arab world, um, the current state of Arabic studies in Portugal is underdeveloped, a situation which has a direct and limiting impact on the volume of translations being produced in Portugal. And, and so there are several uh, Portuguese universities and other institutions of learning. They offer a few, few years of Arabic language courses, but there's still no BA, so Bachelor of Arts or an MA, uh, still doesn't exist uh, in any Portuguese university uh, or even master's or doctoral program. Um, however, there are courses in Islamic history at Portuguese universities or uh, intensive courses on various aspects of Arab culture. Uh, and so it would be useful to have higher education degrees in, in Arabic and the different genres of um, Arabic literature. 
uh, and also Islamic studies, obviously, Quran and Hadith studies, and um, as well as, uh, let's say, pre-Islamic poetry, contemporary um, Arabic poetry and prose, it would be useful to have these courses. Um, and, uh, and so Portuguese students who have undertaken the study of Arabic have often had to rely upon their own personal means and, and resources. Um, as a result, um, there are few Arabists currently active in Portugal, and uh, uh, most of them have had to travel abroad to other European countries or the Arab world to perfect their knowledge of Arabic. Um, also, some Arab countries have offered scholarships to Portuguese students wishing to learn Arabic, such as Tunisia. Um, and also, there are um, uh, in Portugal native Arabic speakers who, uh, from the Arab world, for instance, Egypt, who are activist translators from Arabic into Portuguese. Um, and um, uh, one of them, for instance, Nagib Mahfouz has been translated by uh, Badr Hassanain, who is from Egypt. Um, and so, uh, um, yeah, so it's a complex um, picture. Uh, on the other hand, there are Portuguese courses that um, uh, are in Arab countries, in Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt. And uh, this has allowed for the, the training of translators from uh, Portuguese uh, 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 into Arabic. And for instance, Ein Shams University in Cairo has a Portuguese studies department. Um, and, uh, and if you ask me, yes, I, I, I mean, I started uh, studying Arabic in, in Portugal, then I also, then I, I studied in London and also in Tunisia and Jordan. Uh, now, there is a very different picture in Brazil, fairly different. So um, there are several, um, several uh, countries in the world that have Portuguese as their, their official language. In, in Africa, there are five countries, or Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, and Santomé Prince in Prince. Um, in Portuguese is a co-official language in Equatorial Guinea, and then in Asia, in East Timor. Uh, and obviously, uh, Portuguese is also the official language in Brazil. And the translations I'm aware of, of uh, Arabic and Portuguese, uh, I mean, the ones I, I know of are, are in Portugal and in Brazil. So, um, um, and so the translations of Arabic and Portuguese produced in Brazil, which is, by far the largest Portuguese speaking country in the world in terms of geographical size and population are more numerous than the ones produced in Portugal. And Brazil has more developed uh, academic structures for the study of Arabic. And for instance, the University of Sao Paulo in its Department of Oriental Letters offers a BA in Arabic as well as an MA and a PhD. And uh, and so this difference is uh, in relation to Portugal. <clears throat> it's partly to be explained by the fact that a significant segment of the population in Brazil um, has emigrated, so the immigrants from the Levant and other Arabic speaking countries um, in this immigration started in the 19th century. Um, in Arabic Portuguese translations uh, in Brazil are also of, uh, often available in Portugal. And uh, some of the works translated in Brazil from Arabic into Portuguese are works of medieval Islamic philosophy and historiography. And there's also contemporary literature. Uh, and so while it's not always possible uh, to obtain in Portugal books published in, in Brazil, a uh, Brazilian bookshop recently opened in, in Lisbon and uh, it imports books from Brazil. So this is very useful. Um, and uh, there's some coordination between Portugal and Brazil and collaboration. Um, and for instance, I keep in contact with Brazilian colleagues and one colleague, Dr. Tadeu Gerza, uh, came to AUC uh, for a talk also on, uh, and he also translates from uh, Arabic into Portuguese, medieval Islamic philosophy, and he came 
came in April of last year, 2019. Um, and, and then I, a few weeks later, I went to Brazil and I also gave some lectures there. And this was made possible by a grant from Hustle, which is funded by the uh, Mellon Foundation. Um, and now the third part of my talk, I'll uh, um, speak a little bit about the, the works I've uh, translated um, medieval Islamic, uh, from medieval Islamic philosophy into, um, uh, in, from Arabic into Portuguese, and that's given my specialization. And uh, by the way, recently there's been a, there's a new translation of the Arabian Nights uh, in Port, made in, in Portugal also from Arabic into, into Portuguese. And so the, the first book was, uh, uh, I translated from Arabic into Portuguese was um, Ibn Rajd Sal Aberi's Fasla uh, Maqal, uh, the disciple the treatise on the connection between religion and philosophy. And it's a short work, but very important. Um, and he, he, he writes as a jurist, specialized in the Islamic law. He writes also as a philosopher. And he defends the idea of the, the harmony between philosophy and religion. He states that Islamic law permits the study of philosophy, in some cases recommends it. Um, he also says that there's no contradiction between the message of the Quran and the works of Aristotle. Uh, he addresses al Ghazali's accusation of impiety kufr, against the philosophers, the philosopher, primarily Avicenna and Al-Farabi. Al uh, he states that with respect to theoretical issues, there's no consensus ijma in Islam, although consensus exists when it comes to practical matters. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important work on the relation between philosophy and religion in medieval Islam. Uh, now, some of the difficulties I find in translating, for instance, there are no specialized dictionaries from Arabic and Portuguese, so I use Arabic for Arabic or Arabic into English um, or Arabic into French. So, you know, I avail myself of you know, different dictionaries. Um, and um, I also take into account, obviously, uh, the translation of technical terms, both uh, in, for this work in jurisprudence and in philosophy. And um, the structure and syntax of the Arabic language is different from the syntax of Portuguese. So what I do is I usually uh, make a, a literal translation first, and then I polish um, the Portuguese text so that it becomes intel understandable, intelligible. And uh, I, I typically revise the Portuguese tran translation many times before the, 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 the text is, the translation is ready to, is, um, ready to be published. Uh, now with regard to the translation of particular words, um, uh, I, I take into account the meaning of the term within its context. Um, so the, the same term in Arabic sometimes means different things in Portuguese and also in English. And uh, as an example, a famous example from uh, the decisive treatise is Qiyas. Uh, um, it has two meanings, at least according to the context. So if within a legal context, if we're talking about fit, it means it's usually translated as analogy, well, it would be an analogy in Portuguese. Um, and Qiyas uh, is one of the sources of Islamic law. Um, but within a philosophical context, this was the word used by uh, the Arab translators uh, to convey the term syllogism, uh, which is an essential aspect of formal logic. Um, and so what, when Ibn Rushd used Qiyas, I have to think, you know, does he mean analogy? Is this a legal context? Or does he mean syllogism, which is a, um, a philosophical term? Um, and so the same word in Arabic sometimes has to be translated by two different words in Portuguese. Well, I guess that would be the same in English. Um, also, it's important to take into account the origin of uh, the Arabic words within a, a philosophical framework. And as you know, there was a movement of translation from Greek into Arabic uh, starting in the eighth century. Uh, and for instance, most of Aristotle's works were translate more than once, sometimes more than once from Greek into Arabic. 
uh, and so sometimes you have to think what was the great um, uh, that gave origin to certain um, Arabic term. And for instance, uh, Fadila, which is virtue, uh, can be translated as virtue. Actually, that's the term I use, virtud, in Portuguese. Uh, but some translate as excellent, because Arete in Greek also means um, excellence. Um, and uh, in the decisive treatise, uh, Inrush himself plays with the double meaning of, uh, let's say, the term chaos in other terms. Um, because this means it's the same term in, in uh, jurisprudence and in philosophy, and that's another proof of the agreement between philosophy and religion. Um, and so uh, by using the same term to discuss Islamic legal reasoning and Aristotelian syllogism, um, uh, it purports to show the similarity between religious thinking and philosophical thinking. Uh, and he states uh, when he's talking about Qiyas that in the same way that the tourist must know, know the forms of le legal reasoning, so the student of philosophy must know the different forms of the Aristotelian syllogism, which means uh, someone who wants to study philosophy should study first Aristotle's logic and also his um, philosophical works. Um, and also then on the other hand, it's sometimes necessary to translate uh, two different Arabic terms into the same term in Portuguese due to the smell, similarity of the terms in Arabic. So like sabab and ela or cause, even though they, there is a difference in Arabic, um, sometimes uh, we could just use cause or using two terms and specify which kind of cause um, the author is referring to. Um, another thing that I do is um, when I, uh, translate is I produce a, a glossary of technical terms and actually I use them now for my so there's, there's always a glossary um, at the end of the, the translation and I did this for all the books I translated you know I use them so I remind myself of these technical terms and also I think this is useful for those interesting in knowing um, technical philosophical vocabulary in Arabic and so the decisive treatise was published in Lisbon in 2006. And then the second work I translated was the theology of Aristotle in reality, the theology of the pseudo Aristotle. So this is longer than the decisive treatise. Um, and in fact, um, the theology itself is a translation. Uh, it's a translation of the last three chapters of the Aeneas by Plotinus. So Plotinus wrote in Greek, he was from Egypt. Um, he lived around 200 of the common era um, and he published in, in, in uh, um, he published in, in, in uh, I mean, in, in, in Greek. And this, this was translated into Arabic, the, the last three chapters as the theology of Aristotle. Um, uh, in, because there's a, ref, uh, there's a reference to Aristotle in the prologue and perhaps based on that, the work was attributed to Aristotle, but in fact, it's Plotinus and it's Neoplatonism. Um, and so it can, this work contains several Aristotelian theories regarding the four causes, the concepts of substance and accident, for example. Um, and then in late antiquity, Plotinus, uh, so uh, Plotinus' student Porphyry had defended the harmony between the views of Plato and Aristotle. And, um, Al-Farabi also defends the view, um, the theory of the harmony between uh, the theories of Plato and Aristotle, cites the theology of Aristotle as a proof of that harmony. Be because um, then the translation, um, so the Arabic translation of, of, of this work also has strong Aristotelian elements. So, um, um, so it is kind of a combination of Plato and Aristotle. Uh, Plotinus adopted many Aristotelian theories, but he had his own philosophical system. Uh, and one of the most important theories uh, uh, upheld by Plotinus is the view that there are three main principles the one, intellect, and soul. Each emanates from the previous principle. So uh, the soul emanates from intellect, intellect emanates from the one, and the one is about everything. And then um, after the soul, the terrestrial world comes into being. And uh, 
uh, for instance, Opera Abbey read this work and he adop adopted it, uh, some of these principles and makes everything come to be from the one or the first, which is the name Jesus for God. And uh, in Alpha Abbey's system, there's a series of intellects with their respective spheres, which come to be from God. And finally, uh, the earth comes into being. And the theology of Aristotle also influenced uh, Avicenna, Ibn Sina, and uh, it formed the basis for many Neoplatonist theories and ideas in medieval or classical Islamic philosophy. Uh, and so, in translating the theology, I also took into account uh, technical terms. I produced again a glossary, um, and uh, uh, this one's available online, um, really available online. Uh, in, in, so in the, the last one I published was the al farabis uh, um, and so in Rush died in 1198, uh, Al-Farabi is earlier, he died in 950 um, of the common era, and his main work is Mabadi Ara Ahl al-Madina Fadila, so the principles of the ideas of the inhabitants of the virtuous city, uh, this can also be known, uh, Walser translated it into English as the perfect state, um, I translated it as the virtuous city, a Siddharth virtuosa. And it was published by the Gulbenkian Foundation in Lisbon uh, two years ago, so 2018. Uh, and the first two were published by um, uh, the National Press in Portugal. So now the virtuous city is very, very influential. It's the most important, the last work to um, be written by al Farabi, and it presents its entire philosophical system. And he goes from, you know, from top down. Uh, he starts by describing the first, who is the first cause and its God. He describes his attributes. He argues that there can only be one God. He explains that everything is produced by God, starting with all beings in the celestial realm. And then in the celestial realm, we, we find uh, the celestial spheres, the intellects, he then discusses the world below the moon, which he considers to be the world of generation and corruption. It's constituted by minerals, plants, and animals, including human beings. And he describes uh, uh, human beings in a physical way, like the differences between uh, men and women, uh, and also the different facul faculties of the soul, including reason and imagination. And in connection with imagination, he explains how certain people become prophets. So there's a religious, religious aspect also in this work. And they become prophets by uh, receiving revelation from a higher intellect, um, which in other works he describes as an angel. Um, and then after analyzing human nature in the human faculties, he goes on to describe the political state. So uh, uh, al Farabi, that's a very important uh, uh, political philosophy. He argues that human beings naturally live in communities because they need one another. He describes the nature of the virtuous city where the common good is pursued. And some say this, this is a utopian. Um, and in this virtuous city, the inhabitants have uh, uh, the correct idea, uh, correct idea of reality, of the universe and of God. Uh, he lists and explains the characteristics of the perfect ruler who should be a leader in the philosopher. And he also says that the first ruler of the community should also be a prophet. And he discusses the similarities and differences between philosophy and religion, uh, which are two ways of describing reality. So we can look at reality through the lens of philosophy or through the lens of religion. And at the end of his work, he describes the non-virtuous cities which do not pursue real goods, but only apparent goods like money, honor, and power. And again, so this is very influential work. Um, and um, for instance, the theory of emanation, the conception of God, um, this is adopted by Avicenna, um, and also his ideas about prophecy and the perfect ruler, and the differences between philosophy and religion. And because of his influential ideas, Al Farabi was known in the Middle Ages, so um, as the second teacher from Ali Mathani, only preceded. In, uh, important, uh, by the first teacher was uh, Aristotle. So he was the most important philosopher for, uh, in Islamic philosophy after Aristotle. 
Um, India is very influential in the various fields in which she wrote, metaphysics, epistemology, logic, political theory. And uh, Avicenna adopted from uh, his description of the celestial realm in the theory of emanation. And uh, Ibn Rushd adopted um, his views on the simul similarities and differences between <coughs> religion and philosophy. And now I'm translating another one, which is longer than uh, the other uh, uh, works. Um, and now it's more theo it's philosophy and theology. So I'm translating Al Khasali's Tahafut al Falasifa, the incoherence of the philosophers. And he's also extremely important both in Islamic uh, uh, theology, Al uh, Maghlam, and also um, for philosophers. Um, and so he's an important Muslim thinker and theologian. And he died very easy to memorize. Um, he died in 1111, uh, uh, 11, so of the common era. Um, and he, he was influenced by Al-Ashari. Uh, and he studied under al who was an uh, Ashrite theologian. Um, and as we know, also Al Ashari in turn was influenced by Ahmed ibn Hanbal. So there's this uh, um, debate between the, um, uh, the Mu'tazila and the Ashariya. Um, and um, uh, Al Hazali and Al Ashari as well, they defend the more um, the idea of a literal reading of the Quran in, in relation to the uh, Mu'tazila. Um, and also, uh, he opposed um, the philosophers, the ideas of philosophers, um, in the way that they, uh, according to him, deviated from the literal meaning of the Quran. And he has this autobiography, Al Munkid Amin uh, Dalat, translated into English as The Deliverance from Error. Um, and um, he explains how he became, he, Al Ghazali became interested in, in studying all the sciences. Uh, he became an expert. In Islamic law, um, but even at that time, when he was teaching Islamic law, he was in search for the truth, and he studied different uh, schools of thought in classical Islam. So he studied the views of theologians, the, uh, the views of the philosophers, and the views of the Ismailis, um, which which is a Shia uh, group, um, and but finally decides to follow the Sufi path. Um, which has practical as well as theoretical um, aspects. And so the, in, the, in the incoherence, which I'm translating now, he criticizes the philosophers for not following the apparent text of, of the Quran. <clears throat> and one of the theories he, he criticizes is, in Ibn Sin and al Farabi, is the idea that the world is eternal and did not have a beginning in time. Uh, and so, um, uh, well, I'll continue this and then I'll just mention Ibn Rushd again. He criticized Ibn Sina for stating that God knows particulars in a universal way. He takes this to mean that according to Ibn Sina, God does not know particular things. And he also uh, writes the philosophers for not mentioning uh, the resurrection of the body after death. Um, and so he says that in many issues, so the uh, Tahaft al philosopher we have uh, uh, 20 chapters, the last. Uh, the first 16 are about metaphysical issues. Um, in the last four are about the natural sciences. Um, and, um, and he says in, in many cases, uh, uh, most of the pieces, the philosophers are defending views that, are, uh, that are, had already been defended by theologians. But he says, when it comes to the, uh, these three um, theories that the world's eternal, that God knows particulars in a universal way, and um, uh, for not mentioning the uh, resurrection of the body, he thinks that the, um, the fossil should be accused of heresy, so takfir. Um, and uh, in, in uh, Al Ghazali wrote on many of the issues. He actually has a book which is Maqasid al Philosophy, The Goals of the Philosophers, where he just summarizes Ibn Sina's philosophy. Um, and he's not uh, against the Greek sciences um, completely. So he's interested in mathematics and logic. Um, 
and uh, and so it's very influential in many different aspects. So I chose to translate this work in Portuguese, and I kind of halfway. I mean, I have a rough translation now, and now I have to polish it, which is going to take time. Um, so I think that these works um, are a very important aspect of the um, intellectual life in medieval Islam or classical Islam. I think they deserve to be known. Um, and as I mentioned, first I make the literal translation from Arabic into Portuguese, and then I, I make it closer. So it starts being less Arabic and more Portuguese. Um, obviously I also use footnotes. Uh, in, uh, I also write an introduction and often also a summary of, of the work. Um, and obviously uh, the aim is to uh, convey the text, but also explaining, explaining it to a, a larger audience. And um, I think this, uh, this work has been useful from the feedback I received from my colleagues in Portugal and Brazil, and they use their works in their um, classes and, and for their research. So I think it's been a good reception of these translations. And actually the al farabi is now also um, available online as open access. Um, and so I just wanted to mention a few aspects and I'll, I'll be glad to receive your questions. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I mean, this is uh, really in, uh, truly enriching and uh, quite uh, staggering the, the amount of work that it involves, uh, I believe. And um, I normally we, as I told you before we met, we take a break and then come back. But I can see that we are a small group and that perhaps we can manage uh, the questions from our audience uh, immediately. That's fine. Uh, yeah, is that okay with you? Um, maybe I, I can I take the liberty of be starting until we we get some of the, the questions. I'm fascinated by your um, your formation. I mean, you, I, I read one of the interviews with you where you speak about, you know, philosophy as a childhood sort of passion, right? That you grew up a philosopher uh, from when you were at school and that this was a mandatory uh, subject and that you, you know, um, sort of, it, it worked itself into you. My, I'm interested in, you know, the, the your, and you've worked as we can see on, you know, German idealism on Hegel and other Western uh, philosophers, but then you end up um, specializing in Islamic uh, medieval philosophy. How does that, how did this come about? Um, and, you know, given the, what you've described as uh, in the, the institutional abilities, if you will, in Portugal, you know, um, what kinds of risks were you taking actually as a translator and a philosopher both uh, to specialize in medieval Islamic philosophy when you don't really have a support system within your own uh, culture. Uh, yeah, so my interest in, uh, it's true that I was interested uh, first in German idealism and, and then I became interested in, and so reading Hegel now is, in you know, doing research on Hegel is, well, I didn't do it professionally before, but I was reading Hegel you know, before I read Islamic philosophy, so I'm kind of going back a little bit, um, uh, you know, to German idealism. Um, in then in Portugal, it's true that uh, philosophy is still compulsory in secondary school, and I am glad <laughs> um, that it, that's still the case. At least two years, and actually at three years, so that's that, that's very good. And my brothers are older, so I was trying to sort of. <laughs> Um, they were doing philosophy and uh, I was trying to find out what, what they were doing in uh, at school. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it would be good to have uh, uh, more developed Arabic uh, studies in, in Portugal. We're very close to Morocco, obviously. Um, and, uh, and also I, I, I did, yes, so, so I, I did uh, leave Portugal in order to, to, to do the, you know, the BA in Arabic. In, in Islamic studies, and I ended up 
Spain abroad, um, and uh, and and also translating into uh, into uh, I think right now they're still I mean the translators obviously um, from Arabic and Portuguese in Portugal, but I, I don't think there's anyone doing philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it is a little bit of a risk, but I, I stay in contact with my Brazilian colleagues. I think they're more advanced in that in that respect because um, they have a, a large population of um, people who descended from you know Syrians or Lebanese. Um, and so, uh, in, in, but it, it's it's kind of a little bit of a risk. Sometimes I think, oh, I can translate it any way I like because no one no one's done this or, but at the same time I have to be careful and and uh, you know try because my best because uh, it's a big responsibility but as I say in Brazil they are also translating um, from uh, uh, Arabic and Portuguese fascinating thanks okay we do have a question here um, Okay, it, it, this is the question it reads, I, I, I don't know if you can see, it. as a philosopher, I'm most interested in the philosophical issues. Uh, could you say something about the similarities and differences between Aristotle and Al-Farabi's arguments concerning the eternality of the world? What do you think about their validity? Mm -hmm. uh this is from uh, Professor Robert McIntyre. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Robert. Um, uh, I think uh, I'm trying to remember. So it's in the. Uh, um, uh, I think they're different. So Arsol uh, and Alfred have different arguments because um, Arsol in the physics um, defends the theory of the eternality of the world by saying that God cannot be idle and it cannot be there not produce an effect. Um, it, whereas Al Farabi, because he's adopting this, uh, what Al Farabi did in, was extremely original, um, and we find this in more than one. So we find this in virtuous city, but in other works as well, uh, it combines uh, uh, sort of uh, process of emanation, which we find in Plotinus, uh, with the Plotinian. Um, view of you know the the the, the Putinian, um cosmology uh, and so um Al-Farabi says that the world's eternal because so it's it's different from Aristotle uh it's similar and it's different because from God who's basically who's the first who's an intellect um uh when 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 the first thinks about itself it produces another intellect by emanation and, uh, and obviously, because uh, this the first is always thinking itself, the this first emanate intellect has to um, proceed immediately. And so that, and, and then we have a second intellect, etc. And then have we have the celestial realm, and then we have, um, and then we have the um, uh, the earth, which is the world of generation and corruption. So slightly different, but this, the principles are. Are similar, and I think, yeah, perhaps they are uh, valid from a philosophical point of view. But again, um, um, uh, it's the principles. I think are the same, and uh, but yeah, the 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 Quran clearly says in the Bible as well uh, that the world was created in six days. So then Al Hasali didn't like this. He said this is completely unacceptable to to so that the world was eternal. Um, okay, we have a question from uh, Gretchen. I'm sorry, it keeps coming up. Um, and the question is, you can see it, did your mother encourage you uh, in your interest in philosophy? Uh, and your father was a distinguished poet. Was he interested in translation? Uh, thank you, Gretchen. Great question, yeah. Yeah, so yes, my brother did encourage me. Well, yeah, it was interesting because my, uh, uh, so the eldest brother was saying, oh, you should study law or economics because otherwise, you know, 
my video would find a job. Even my mother just let us do anything we liked. So she always encouraged me. She encouraged me to translate as well. I also translated from um, uh, this is actually still in Portugal from uh, English into Portuguese. Um, some works. One of them, actually, I think the one I enjoyed most was Cheryl Darrell's My Family and Other Animals. And there was a, a series recently. And, and so I, I translated the, that one uh, a long time ago. I think it came out in 95 in Portugal. Uh, in my father as well, yes, he did translate. So he translated uh, from French into Portuguese and those have been published and they were republished in in Portugal. So there is a, there is a, and my mother also translated one book, uh, literature from French uh, into Portuguese. And it's interesting also that uh, uh, high school or secondary school in, in Portugal um, can be quite specialized. So we have philosophy and I actually took a year of sort of a course on translation with, with other classmates. And so I, I, yeah, we did study sort of the principles of translation in, in secondary school in Portugal. And, and yes, both my mother translated and my father as well, um, mainly French, French authors. So French in Portugal. This is uh, wonderful to know that translation is a, a family trade, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Everybody's. So you grew up not just a philosopher, but also a translator, basically. I, yes, uh, I, 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 yeah, I think I started at the age of um, 20, yeah, uh, 19, 20, yeah, translating. Fascinating. Let me ask you a question, if I may, because you, I, I noticed that you also, you know, you have an introduction to your translated works, you have a notes to your, but you also have glossaries. And you did speak about, you know, technical terms and sort of uh, keeping a record of these technical terms so that they are consistent in, you know, other translations as you go along. Um, how familiar, I mean, how familiar does this lexicon become as you go through these philosophical works? Um, uh, so that you, you know, you know, after a, a while that this has to be X and this has to be Y and this, you don't have to think about it anymore, but you still, I, I guess, need to provide a provide a glossary I, I yes I always do because for instance now with uh, uh, for instance Alfrabi will have a kind of vocabulary which is more um, neoplatonic um, then even which has speak um, uh, Alfrabi also has neoplatonic and I mean I, I could change my mind or perhaps translate the same term I think it's completely wrong some people have this principle oh you have to translate the same word always in the same way I think that's <laughs> uh, unless you're saying the same way you mean different words because um and now with um uh, al Hazali, uh, obviously there are many terms from theology so that's a new that's right. something new so that's why you know I, ha I always have a glossary yeah, yeah okay if, 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 I, I, do you I mean, this is probably a publication on its own. Yes, yes. So I've, I've, I've got a contract with the Gulbenkian Foundation for this one as well. Yes, for yeah. it. Yes. I can imagine, right. Uh, okay, we have some questions here. I just, uh, do we have more questions? You, we seem to have more questions. Here we go. Okay, it's from Gretchen again. You mentioned using dictionaries. Uh, do you consult other translators? With translating uh, with Muhammad, we can discuss his intentions about what he means. Have there been occasions when you weren't sure of the author's intentions? Yeah, uh, thank you, Gretchen. You have a very good question. Um, uh, I consult, uh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, I consult other translate uh, and also other translations. And sometimes I'm not in, entirely sure, but I could uh, read different translations and I could consult colleagues as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm not completely alone in this. Yeah, there's plenty of 
support in their different dictionaries as well. Yeah, but sometimes it is difficult to know. And obviously, you know, these ones are not, uh, yeah, I mean, you can consult, you can consult Muhammad directly. And I, <laughs> in my case, I have to try to find out. Okay, there's another question uh, from uh, Rosette Tophilis. Uh, poetry and philosophy be mutually reinforcing? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a, um, a very good question. Um, my father was also interested in, in philosophy and that's why, you know, in his library there's still a philosophy books and actually that's how I started reading philosophy but um uh and I think some some uh within the history of philosophy uh some philosophers have been very critical of poetry like Plato uh then Aristotle has a different view and in someone like Hegel uh in the uh, uh early 19th century thinks that poetry is the highest form of artistic expression uh, because in the, the his reason, you know, his argument of saying this is that, uh, you know, he, he's very keen on the spirit and, and spiritual things. And, and he says that poetry uh, uses the least uh, material support. Uh, the opposite would be architecture, where you see the building and it's something massive. Uh, even uh, a painting you have um, and, and uh, with other forms, but he thinks uh, that poetry is the most spiritual uh, uh, kind of um, uh, artistic form. And so he thinks that poetry is above any other kind of artistic expression. And I think this makes up for Plato criticizing the poets. And uh, But I think poetry is, is very, very difficult. So that would be a very difficult genre to translate. And I haven't really tried it, but um, you know, I, I think I'm... Uh, to philosophy for now. Well, yeah, that, that's a lot to think about, actually. Yeah. We have a question from uh, our colleague, Dina Heshma, mm -hmm. um, and her question, I mean, it's compounded, right? Uh, could you speak about the reception of the works by Arab philosophers you have translated in Portugal and or in Brazil? And could you give us some information about the publishers? of those works and uh, the readers of these translations. All right, so from the uh, um, uh, the publishers and the readers, okay. So <clears throat> uh, I think it's uh, been well received. So uh, I get uh, feedback mainly from, from colleagues who are saying that they're using, uh, now they can teach, let's say even a colleague who's a specialist in medieval, say, Christian philosophy, they can teach, uh, if they're teach, teaching medieval philosophy, they can teach now uh, these works or sections, and they can talk about al Arabi or even Rush and, and use uh, the text in, in, in Portuguese. Um, and so I have feedback from my colleagues and it's been very positive in Brazil as well. And I know that students in Portugal and Brazil are using uh, uh, the translation. Um, and so, so it's from my, my colleagues, and there's also someone, a colleague who's a historian, historian is also a politician in Portugal, and he's even published about, uh, written about Al-Farabi uh, in, uh, in the media, and, and I met with him and he said, you know, it's a great thing that, um, and he got in touch with me because he saw the translation, and, and he saw that I had translated and he wanted to get in touch with me, so I think it's, it's making a difference. In the publishers, so the first one, the uh, uh, the National Press, uh, that's so the first uh, two, the Theology of Aristotle and, um, um, and, um, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, Decisive Treatise were published by the National Press, that's kind of the main uh, press in Portugal, and they publish academic works mainly. Um, and then uh, Afrabi, uh, my translation was published by the Gulbenkian Foundation, and uh, uh, it's uh, they're very important cultural in, in institutions. They they were almost like the the, mini, the the Ministry of Culture all by itself in the uh, you know before the revolution in seventy four, um, and they they get scholarships. They have a very important museum with important works of art, including Islamic art, 
um, and they, uh, yeah, so they have the museums, uh, an orchestra, a very important cultural institution in uh, in Portugal, and who's reading? Well, I guess uh, my colleagues, their students, and, and also I suppose the general public. Um, so I get a little bit of feedback, but I don't have sort of a systematic uh, idea of of the reception. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah. Okay, as a colleague, you know, and I, I can imagine that you know. Um, what you do as a, a translator of uh, medieval Islamic philosophy is, is, is substantially different from what you do in the classroom, right, mm -hmm. at AUC. You know. And my question to you is, how do, how do these two come together? How frustrating is it? Um, uh, do you actually have a space within the academy, um, in the classroom, to um, you know, uh, celebrate yourself, and there's a, a lot to celebrate. Do your students know who you are? Uh, what your accomplishments are in in this field, or is this something that you you know that sort of is is marginalized um, within your classroom uh, and with your students? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think everyone wonders. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's not just me, but other colleagues, whether, you know, the students know what anything about our research and um, uh, specializations. I wonder about that. There was one student in philosophical thinking who knew that I, this semester, but I think this was the first time, so I was almost shocked. There was a student in philosophical thinking who said, oh, yeah, I know you specialize in medieval Islamic philosophy, because I think they, yeah, they think of us as uh, instructors primarily. Uh, however, in, ter in terms of the class um, uh, in philosophical thinking, I do, uh, I mean, I have to think about the level. It can't be a very difficult uh, um, uh, philosophical work, but I, I try to find something that appeals to the students and appeals to me that, that we can have in common. That's possible even in philosophical thinking. And then in Islamic philosophy, it's very interesting how the uh, uh, the response of the students, if they in Rosh Al Ghazali, sometimes they don't really say it, but they might think, "Oh, well, Ibn Rush is not being really, you know, yeah, he's not really following, you know, the text of the Quran, or maybe the interpretations are not." I don't really agree with this. So there's a debate, and um, I think it was interesting when we had uh, more American students, uh, um, uh, you know, 2010 and before that. Uh, it was very interesting because there would be the American students at one perspective. You know, I teach uh, Islamic philosophy at the undergraduate level. I, I would have 20 students, and then let's say the, the uh, Egyptian students are rooting for Ghazali, and then the uh, some American students uh, defending um, in Rushd. Or, so it was very interesting. And, and the, I think there's still an, an interesting debate to see how, how the students uh, react to these texts. And uh, what I do, uh, usually, I really like to follow the um, uh, sometimes I read more contemporary text, I teach more contemporary text, but I like the, the classics and, and really following uh, the text and the arguments in, in the ideas. So I think um, I think it has been useful to, I mean, even at philosophical thinking, which is an introduction to philosophy, it is possible to have some debate. And now I teach uh, Islamic philosophy uh, uh, to the MA students. And I think, I, I, I am curious to know how they, react to this, um, you know, Islamic philosophy, because uh, Islamic philosophy, you know, often they've heard about, uh, you've seen in Rush al-Farabi, and they, it's considered, they're considered to be, you know, the high point of classical Islam, but then when they read them, maybe they have a little bit of prejudice because they think, you know, oh, they're not completely orthodox or, so uh, I, it's interesting to, to, to have um, that debate. So so I think it, it, it's been good to, I mean, I try to make the most of, uh, uh, I mean, to, to teach things that are related somehow to my research, but also that appeal to the students. Do we have any more questions? Or should I go ahead and ask the last one? Um, 
I mean, there obviously you have to deal with both worlds, you know, the theological and the philosophical, and that's a very a risky thing to do, right? Uh, in Cairo, at the American University, uh, as a foreigner, uh -huh. uh, challenged by, you know, a crowd of students who are predominantly, you know, Egyptian and Arab. Uh, how do you navigate this? Because you know, the, the, this also, uh, and there also you are a translator, uh, uh, a translator who probably is taking less risks, uh, trying to take less risks uh, than you would in other contexts. So you can, could you speak to that? Because I think it's a, it's a, I mean, you have very thorny, uh, topics to sort of engage and, and, and navigate in a, in a rather, um, uh, in a minefield, a potential minefield. Thank you. And yeah, I just saw the, uh, uh, the, the thread, which, uh, and uh, like, thank also President Richard Oni for his comment. Um, and uh, yeah, that, sometimes I think about that. Um, but I mean, I think even in, in Arabic, uh, um, you have you know Europeans and Americans teaching, in that they may have a similar experience uh, to mine, um, and I, I I think it hasn't become an issue um, because medieval or classical Islamic philosophy is um, quite specialized. Uh, so I think the students, um, I mean, I haven't had any direct uh, uh, negative comments that way because I'm coming from a different culture. Um, it hasn't, I don't think it has been a problem. Um, but yeah, it, it's just that students sometimes have this uh, reaction to, um, to um, uh, Isla Islamic philosophy because, you know, sometimes students think, ah, oh, this is not really completely Islamic or, so the, you know, it, it's a little bit difficult. So uh, sometimes, but I try to say, you know, there's so many, if you study, uh, uh, you know, Islamic theology, and there's so many different perspectives. We can't think that, you know, Al-Ghazali just, and he's extremely important in uh, that, 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 that this is the only way of thinking about Islam. I mean, there are many other ways, and you just have to read your own, you know, the authors within your own culture, you, your own history. So, um, you know, so, I mean, I see, I mean, I think about that sometimes, but I don't think it has been a big, a big obstacle. I think if I taught in Europe, I would have other different challenges, but I don't think they would be. Uh, it, it, it would be less difficult there because I think I would also get. I would probably get questions about Islam. Or, um, mm -hmm. I don't. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that it would be sort of a more comfortable position in, in that respect. But it's a good question. Sometimes I think about this, but I also think about my colleagues in Eric who are from, you know, Europe or the US. And uh, so it's, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you could all, you could add something about that. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm, it, it's, it's, um, it, uh, it, um, it, for, for me, I mean, the questions of, you know, this marriage between theology and philosophy, you know, uh, within your context, especially if you are not, you know, um, if you are a, an outsider uh, mm -hmm. to the culture and you will always be considered one by your uh, audience, you know, so, and given the context in general in which we all operate, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my question is, how much treading uh, softly do you have to do in order to sort of uh, safeguard the, the space without, you know, any major eruptions, objections? Uh, this is not Islam. This is not, uh, you know, which, which many of our uh, students, unfortunately, um, are capable of doing because of, uh, you know, um, uh, um, things they think they know uh, and therefore are not open to actual, uh, you know, new perspectives, uh, new forms of knowledge, uh, etc. And I think you're right, you're not 
and I'm just not, not pointing a finger at you. I think we all suffer from the same problem, but perhaps in your uh, situation, because of the, 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 the topics or subjects or fields that you have to do, deal with it becomes more acute sometimes right? yeah I, I uh, yes i guess i guess it could be but i think um uh one of the issues with uh, uh classical or medieval i don't like the term medieval for islam because in europe it's kind of it means it's between antiquity and the renaissance so it's kind of sort of unimportant but classical islam is is not medieval in that sense so um uh I, I think it's fairly specialized so i think the students understand that this is not you know I'm, we're not just talking about religion um uh it, it, because it's uh the difficulty with teaching uh islamic philosophy is it's it's good very important to have good knowledge of aristotle and i you know give them some of the background uh um it, usually i have also a, a, a glossary with technical terms and I explain them uh, in, in some of the students, at least in the MA, they have taken uh, ancient Greek philosophy, so they have some grounding in that. Um, and so I think they realize that this is a technical, um, you know, it's a, it's a specialized field and it, it's not just about a religion or, or, the, or the way of interpreting a religion, but it is a combination of philosophy and, and, and religion. And that's an, it's specialized. So they can't just say, oh, this is not, I mean, they might have that impression, but they still, I still, you know, they still have to know what the philosophers did, the arguments, um, the ideas. And actually, for instance, there was one uh, a student in, in the um, uh, medieval uh, Islam, uh, Islamic philosophy seminar who was saying, oh, no, this is not how you, um, I'm trying to remember the, the question or the objection. He said, oh, this is not how you translate uh, this term. Oh, you don't say in Arabic, this is not how you say it. And I said, this is how uh, in the in the ninth, ninth, ninth century, this Greek term was translated into Arabic. I, you know, I it's not up to me. So, and that was the end of the conversation. We can't. Uh, so if they start saying, "Oh no, this is not the way you say it," I said, "No, no, this it, it is. This is how they translate it. If you read the original, you're stuck with this term in Arabic. There's no other way. I mean, you could try to translate that into." Uh, contemporary Arabic, but you can't do anything about that actual translation in the way, and those translations were being read by uh, Ibn Rushd and Ibn Sina, so those are the terms that they used. Yeah. Yeah, so because it's technical, I don't think they can just say, oh, this is not, and I, tr I try to tell them there are many ways of, uh, and even now I'm uh, teaching Al-Khazali in philosophy of religion, uh, and I say, you know, that Al-Khazali, Ibn Rushd and Al-Khazali, I say Al-Khazali is coming from a particular school of theology. We can't say that this is all of Islam, or if we want to be good Sunni, you have to follow Al-Khazali because he's following the Asherites. And for the Asherites, there were the Mutazilites. And I mean, there, it's just a, a question of choice. And it's very interesting that Ibn Rush says, when it comes to theoretical aspects, uh, because he wanted to say um, Al-Khazali had no business to condemn the uh, philosophers for heresy, he says, when it comes to theoretical as, uh, aspects, there's no uh, consensus in Islam. There's no ishma. So he could not, you know, profess his takfir of the philosophers because this was, and he was a, a faqih as well. He's a very famous jurist and he has a very famous um, work in uh, Islamic jurisprudence. So we can't say in Rush. I mean, if you say that he's not being Islam, you have to be very careful because he's coming from this background of famous judges and uh, jurists uh, within Al Andalus. His grandfather was a very famous jurist, so uh, we have to be careful. We have to respect these uh, authors. Fascinating. Um, do we have more questions for Katarina? I think this is it. Um, well, I thank you for a very enriching evening. I'm sorry some of us are not uh, specialized, specialized in this specialized field, but you know the, 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 the world that you open up. And I must say it must, there's a tremendous lot of dedication in, in doing this. Uh, 
because you know that it is a very specialized field and you have a limited readership at the end of the day. And it really is just a group of specialists who are benefiting from your knowledge. Uh, and yet it is so enriching to uh, know that uh, one, you know, you continue to produce these translations that you, um, you know, are working onward, um, even if this readership is limited, because there seems to be a, you're on a mission, right? Yes. Yes. Sir. And, and I think this is in and of itself really salutary in a world where, you know, people are losing sight of a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so thank you for your dedication and you know I'm really very proud to be able to host you and celebrate your accomplishments and achievements and uh, yeah and good luck with your future projects which seem to be several already on the table yes thank you so much pleasure was all mine thank you so much for the invitation and I thank the center for translation and, uh, and also like to thank all the participants and all your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. <laughs>